Good afternoon. My name is Tom Bruner, and I'm the president and CEO of Glaucoma Research Foundation. Welcome to our webinar, What's New in Glaucoma Medications? Today, we will learn about current and new medication options to treat glaucoma. Dr. David Richardson has very kindly agreed to join me today to talk about glaucoma treatment options, and we'll try to answer as many of your questions as possible. David is a glaucoma specialist and medical director at San Marino Eye in Southern California. He went to Harvard Medical School in Boston and did his ophthalmology residency at University of Southern California, Doheny Eye Institute. David is also an attending ophthalmologist at the Veterans Health Administration in Los Angeles and one of our newest ambassadors for Glaucoma Research Foundation. It is my honor to welcome Dr. David Richardson. So welcome everyone, and uh, hopefully this will be an informative hour for you. So let's uh, go ahead and get started. All right. Now, before I go over the medical treatment of glaucoma, I think it's important to take a couple of minutes just to introduce intraocular pressure and aqueous fluid, because these are intimately related to what we're going to be talking about. So if we look at the schematic of an eye, we can see the front of the eye here with the cornea, the iris, light is focused through the lens back to the retina, and the signal is then sent out to the brain through the optic nerve, 15 here. Now the optic nerve is what's damaged in glaucoma and that damage is often related to elevated pressure. So let's talk about pressure. The pressure in the eye is important in that you need some pressure to keep the eye round, just like you need pressure to keep a ball around. That pressure is produced by the balance between the production of fluid, what we call aqueous fluid, which bathes the internal structures of the eye, provides nutrients, helps remove waste products. Now, this fluid is produced behind the iris uh, in these little finger-like projections. Right? And so these are called ciliary processes. They produce fluid, which then goes around within the eye and then leaves the eye between the lens and the iris through the pupil and out the trabecular meshwork. Uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about that, but uh, just know that the trabecular meshwork is believed to be the primary source of resistance uh, to fluid leaving the eye. All right. uh, there are other mechanisms by which fluid can leave the eye, including uh, through what's called the uveoscleral pathway, which uh, is basically between the iris here and the trabecular meshwork, and it leaves this way. Uh, but for the most part, uh, it's the trabecular meshwork that we're concerned about. So again, production here uh, flows through the eye and leaves through the trabecular meshwork. Now, before we talk about new medications, let's first review what's old. Right? It's worth knowing how the medications that have been around and uh, the medications that most of you who are on this conference are likely taking. It's worth knowing a little bit more about these than you may have been told in the, in the visit in the um, medical office. So we're going to start with one that's really old, pilocarpine. Very few of you are probably taking pilocarpine, and we'll, we'll talk about why. So pilocarpine is what we call a meiotic, and meiotic basically constricts the pupil. Uh, by constricting the pupil, it kind of tugs on the trabecular meshwork, stretching it open. By stretching it open, fluid can then leave uh, through the trabecular meshwork and uh, out the eye. Uh, the problem is that you have to take this drop four times a day. Now, I doubt that most of us on this conference are organized enough or OCD enough to actually take something four times a day regularly. Uh, for chronic uh, period of time. So for that reason, it's not, uh, it's not a drop that we see much. And also because the side effects are quite severe, headache, blurred vision, uh, there are systemic side effects such as gastrointestinal distress, diarrhea, so pretty unpleasant really. Uh, it used to be quite cheap, but as with many generics now, for reasons why I can't explain, uh, it's now uh, 10 times that expensive. So 
it's just not something that uh, that you're going to see prescribed very very frequently. So let's move to another uh, older drop, the beta blocker class of medications. This class has been around for half a century. Uh, it's very effective. Uh, the most commonly prescribed one is Timolol, uh, although I have been of late uh, prescribing an older one, Vitaxolol, which we may get into why that one uh, would be worth uh, prescribing at some point. Uh, the method is by decreasing production of aqueous fluid. So it doesn't actually work at the level of the resistance. It, it reduces the amount of fluid. So it's just like you've got a, you know, a sink, you've got the faucet, you've got the sink, you've got the drain. Uh, the problem is at the drain, but many of the treatments are not working at the drain, they're working at the faucet. So this basically decreases the flow of fluid or the production of fluid. Uh, the nice thing about beta blockers is that they can be taken once a day in the morning uh, or twice a day. And we may discuss at some point why once a day may actually be preferred. Um, side effects, side effects, low blood pressure, low heart rate, difficulty breathing. So this is one of the few medications that although it's working at the level of the eye can actually cause systemic issues. And so we need to be very careful about that in certain people. There are methods to decrease the systemic effects, and we may get into that during the Q&A uh, portion of this talk. Cost. This is one of the least expensive drops out there. You should be able to get this for, used to be as, as cheap as $3 at Walmart. I think they might have upped it to about five. But if you're paying more than uh, 20, $25 a month, you're, you're, you're getting ripped off. Um, if it's generic. Now, it can be much more expensive if it's a branded one. Um, and uh, we'll talk about also combination medications. Many of these medications are in what are called fixed combinations. So you're getting not just one class of medication, but two classes. And so Timolol or the beta blocker class is available in uh, COSOP and Combigan are the brand names for the fixed combinations that have beta blockers. Now, I just mentioned COSOP. COSOP is Timolol plus uh, a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. So the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, commonly uh, branded here in the U.S. as Azopt and Trusopt, um, are newer than the beta blockers and pilocarpine. Uh, they work also by reducing production of aqueous fluid. Um, unfortunately, uh, it needs to be taken multiple times a day, at least twice, uh, ideally really three times a day to get the best effect, which is very difficult for most people to get that middle of the day dose in. Side effects are pretty much limited to stinging. Uh, so you wouldn't think that would be a big issue, but I've had patients say that it stings more than they can tolerate. Cost, generics uh, can be inexpensive. Branded ones can be quite expensive. This may be one of the classes of medications where the brand actually does work better than the generic. Um, there have been some issues with some of the generic uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, dorsolamide, and it is available in combination. So combined with Timolol, the bit blocker in COSOP, and combined with the next class I'm going to talk about, the alpha agonist in Simbrinza. So let's talk about the alpha agonist class. Um, this is a, uh, the bromonidine is the generic name for the most commonly prescribed. The brand name is Alphagan P. And uh, how it works. This one also works by decreasing production, but it does have the benefit of increasing outflow as well, but not through the trabecular meshwork. It increases the outflow through the uveoscleral pathway, which I briefly mentioned earlier. This one, unfortunately, also has to be taken at least twice, but ideally three times a day. Uh, and there's mounting evidence that it really does need to be taken three times a day for the best effect, which limits uh, its usefulness. Uh, side effects, pretty much limited to red eye and allergy. Allergy can be pretty significant with this class, somewhere between 10 and 15% of people who take this will eventually develop an allergy and have to stop it. Uh, the cost, the generic 0.2% is inexpensive and covered by most insurances, but is the one that's most likely to result in allergy. Um, the 0.1% is the brand. Uh, the 0.15% is available generically. Um, oddly, whether it's generic, 0.15 or branded, they're both kind of expensive. 
Uh, and it is available in two combinations, one with tamolol, so combagan, and one with the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, some brings up. Now, uh, one of the newer medications, uh, this came out during my residency, uh, so about uh, 20, 25 years ago in that range, the prostaglandin analog class of medications. This revolutionized uh, the treatment of glaucoma. Um, we see this in multiple brands, Zalatan, Lumigan, Travitan Z, Zioptan, uh, there's another one, Zelpros, that uh, which just came out. How it works, this actually works by increasing the outflow, so helping fluid leave the eye through the uveos pleural pathway. So again, not through the trabecular meshwork, which is the primary point of resistance. Um, it's taken only once in the evening. It can actually be taken any time, but we generally recommend it in the evening because one of the side effects is redness. And it's thought that if you take it in the evening, some of that redness uh, will be resolved by morning. Uh, there are other cosmet largely cosmetic side effects associated with it, iris color change. If you've got hazel eyes that become more brown, uh, brown eyes stay brown, uh, blue eyes without any pigment or, or uh, brown spots in them pretty much stay the same. But if you're, you're in that, uh, that blue with pigment or hazel, your, your irises will get darker and it's a permanent change. Long lashes, a temporary change, appreciated by some, not by others. And uh, then there's eyelid tissue changes, the prostaglandin-associated periorbitopathy we, we speak of now. Uh, we may get into that in the Q&A. Cost, it really depends on which one you're getting. If it's a... Uh, the generic latanoprost should be very inexpensive, between you know, 10 and $20 a, a bottle. The brands are uh, more expensive. The good news is that it really the generic latanoprost seems to work just about as well as most of the brands. There are some reasons to consider the brands, which again, we may get into later. It is available in combination, uh, the combination with the, uh, the newest uh, class of medications, which I will be talking about, and that's a uh, Rocklatan, which is latanoprost plus natarsudil, a rock inhibitor. So that's the old. Uh, now let's get into what's new because there are some really exciting things in the uh, treatment of glaucoma here. So the first one is nitric oxide donators. Okay? And uh, the brand name of this is Visolta. So what is a nitric oxide donator? Well, uh, nitric oxide is a, uh, is a molecule that when released in the eye can do a number of interesting things. So it uh, potentially increases blood supply. Uh, now, whether it increases blood supply to the optic nerve itself is not entirely known, but we, we do know now that uh, glaucoma is not just a pressure-related disease, but there's probably a perfusion aspect to it. So it's exciting to think that uh, there might be something that could actually uh, treat glaucoma through a mechanism other than just intraocular pressure. So this, this is exciting for that reason. But the other thing is that nitric oxide actually kind of relaxes the trabecular meshwork and the canal, Schlem's canal behind the trabecular meshwork. So this medication, this class, actually works at the point of resistance. And so it's exciting when we've got something that's working where the problem is. Um, now, Visolta, it's not just a nitric oxide donator. It's what I call latanoprost plus. So it's a prostaglandin analog plus a nitric oxide donator. Um, so as I mentioned, it works by increasing aqueous outflow, but it does, does so through both the uveal scleral pathway, which is the prostaglandin portion does, and the trabecular meshwork, the nitric oxide portion. Uh, it's taken once nightly, so it's nice and convenient. The side effects are identical to the prostaglandin analog class because it is a prostaglandin plus the nitric oxide donating component. So there really does not seem to be any specific side effect related to the nitric oxide portion of this. Cost, this is going to depend on insurance coverage. Coverage. Since this is a new medication, there's no generic available. If your insurance does not cover it, it will be very expensive in the hundreds of dollars per month uh, range. It is not available in combination, but I pretty much view this as a combination drop, a combination of a prostaglandin analog and a nitric oxide uh, donator. So now uh, another really exciting uh, development is the class of 
row kinase inhibitors, so rock inhibitors. So essentially, you have to understand that from uh, the, the turn of the millennium to just a couple of years ago, 2017, we had no updates in glaucoma therapy. There was nothing new. And then both Visolta and Ropressa were FDA approved in 2017. So Ropressa, or Natarsudil is the, uh, the generic name, is very interesting because this works at the level of the trabecular meshwork, and it does so by actually changing the structure of it. So if you can think of it uh, in terms of a meshwork, in glaucoma, patients with glaucoma, the trabecular meshwork gets stiff and does not allow fluid through it as easily. Repressa actually works over time to uh, make the trabecular meshwork more flexible uh, and um, essentially allow the fluid through the trabecular meshwork into the Schlem's canal. This doesn't work right away. It takes many weeks to actually uh, make this change, which is uh, an interesting element of this medication. Uh, but there are other things that it seems to do as well. So uh, Ropressa also lowers the episcleral venous pressure. So that's the pressure uh, of the vessels into which aqueous fluid uh, flows. So, you know, pressure or fluid tends to flow down a pressure gradient. So if you can lower the pressure of the destination of the fluid, in this case, the episcleral venous pressure, then you can potentially bring the pressure down even lower. Um, there may also be other benefits of this class, including uh, improved blood supply. So um, it, it's a very interesting class of medications. We, we don't know everything about it yet, um, but what we do know about it is uh, it's very exciting. Now, how it works, we just talked about that, how it is taken once nightly. So uh, wonderfully convenient side effects, uh, red eye and achy eye. And the redness can be pretty severe. The achiness tends to be temporary, but it can last for a few days to a week. Most people that can push through it, uh, get used to it, the redness gets better uh, and the, uh, the pressure goes down. How, it, how effective is it? Well, it's, uh, it's interesting because it seems to bring the pressure down by between four and six millimeters of mercury, regardless of the starting pressure, which is unusual. Most drops bring the pressure down by, let's say, 20, 30%. So if you start with a higher pressure, you get a larger uh, uh, millimeter mercury difference, which means most medications don't work all that well for what we call low tension glaucoma because the pressure is already so low. Uh, now, Tarsudil actually seems to work well, even with. Uh, low or normal tension glaucoma. And that may have to do with the uh, episcleral venous pressure lowering that I just discussed. Cost. This is a new medication and uh, no generic available. If it's not covered by insurance, it's probably going to be on the order of $300 a month, meaning it's not going to be affordable. It is now available in a combination, which is uh, Roclitan, which is Latanoprost plus Metarsudil. So you're actually getting a uh, both uh, class benefits uh, in a once nightly draw. And then um, the last thing I want to talk about in terms of what's new is uh, really interesting and something that a year or so ago, had you asked me about this, I would have thought that there was no need for this. Uh, this is Durista, uh, the Matoprost. It's actually an implant, it's not a draw. This is a prostaglandin analog that is injected into the front of the eye, so between the cornea and the iris. Now, why would, uh, a couple of years ago, I thought this would be unnecessary? Well, because the prostaglandin analog class is for the most part well tolerated. It's once nightly, it's available generically, and it works, works well. Even if you miss a drop periodically, uh, it seems to be strong enough to carry over. So why in the world would anybody actually go into an office every four months to have something injected into their eye. Um, I just didn't think there was a lot of need for that. But here's the interesting thing. The initial studies looking at the Matoprost in which people had this injected in their eye uh, three times, so it would call uh, 0 0.0, four months later and eight months later, one would think that by 12 months out, uh, the effect would have been lost. So it was only supposed to last about four months. 
the study looked at people who had had only those three implants and many of these people two years out, so from, a, from the initial injection, so a full year from their last injection, still had pressure control. And so this really has us rethinking um, the benefit of placing implants with medications in the eye in high concentration rather than on the surface of the eye where you can get into all of these other side effects that I mentioned, both uh, surface side effects as well as systemic. None of those should be an issue in an implant. So anyway, we've uh, much, I'm sure, to talk about still with the, uh, with the Q&A. But that is uh, what's new. And FD, everything I've talked about today has been FDA approved. There are other things that are interesting that are in the works, but um, all of this is now available. Uh, the question for the newer stuff, as I've already uh, alluded to, is cost. You know, we don't know how much, for example, Darista is going to cost and which insurances, if any, will actually cover it. But assuming that the, it is affordable, um, this is a very exciting time. Are you uh, ready for questions? Yes. Okay. We, thank you very much, uh, David. That was um, just an incredible presentation. Uh, I learned a lot and I'm sure our participants did. So our first question um, is about dry eye and uh, what can be done you know, about that and the fact that many glaucoma patients uh, feel that the eye drops may be, may be contributing. So would you care to comment on that? Absolutely. Uh, before I get to uh, the issue of why do most glaucoma eye drops cause dry eye, I first want to uh, pull back to recognize that the glaucoma drops may not be causing the dry eye. Many people who have dry eye already are not necessarily symptomatic. And then when you add the glaucoma drops, many people with dry eye will then become symptomatic. And this is because both dry eye and glaucoma are more common as we get older. Uh, most people with a mild amount of dry eye aren't necessarily bothered by it. But when you add something uh, to the surface of the eye, whether it's an eye drop or contact lens or uh, you know, other activities or things, it can push the dry eye to the point where you start to notice it. Now, what is it about glaucoma drops that worsen dry eye? Because again, it doesn't generally cause it on its own, but it tends to worsen it to the point where it's, it's symptomatic or more symptomatic. Most glaucoma drops have a preservative in them called benzalkonium chloride. Benzalkonium chloride, or BAC for short, uh, has been shown to actually um, damage some of the cells on the surface of the eye that are necessary for proper lubrication and protection with a, a good quality tear film. So in somebody who is taking especially multiple glaucoma drops a day, uh, that, that building up of the back frequently over time can actually worsen dry eye. Uh, and so as far as uh, what can be done to alleviate it, um, one of the things to consider would be switching from back to preservative-free um, drops or uh, drops that have a preservative that is a non-back preservative. So, for example, Alpha P, the branded bromonidine, has a preservative called Purite in it, which essentially uh, disappears uh, upon contact with the surface of the eye. So, so those are two things that I, I will often recommend. Uh, as uh, methods to alleviate the dry eye exacerbation from back. So our next question is about uh, eye drops that are preservative free and what are the benefits of preservative free medications? Right, so this is a nice uh, stay away from what we were just talking about. Uh, for those who do have irritation from the back, moving to preservative free eye drops eliminates the back. And so in theory should not exacerbate or worsen dry eye. Uh, as far as the brands that, have, that are preservative free, uh, the beta blocker class, Tamalol is available in a brand uh, Ocudose. Um, the uh, fixed combination 
Timolol and carbonic anhydrase inhibitor is available preservative-free in COSOPT PF, PF for preservative-free. Uh, there's also a prostaglandin analog, Zyoptan, which is preservative-free. And then uh, Zelpros is, is one of these that has uh, kind of a disappearing preservative. Um, these are all brands. And as brands, they can be quite expensive. Uh, although, oddly enough, I found that many insurances will cover uh, Zyoptan as a prostaglandin analog. There are other options as well. There are pharmacies in the U.S. that compound uh, glaucoma medications. Impermis is one of the uh, more common ones that will provide uh, combination drops in a preservative-free form. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's what I would consider as one of those options for somebody who does have a significant amount of symptomatic dry eye uh, and needs to take glaucoma medications. And our third question is about side effects. And you talked a lot about that uh, during your, your excellent presentation, but I wonder if you um, can comment about when should a patient actually be concerned about side effects or, or when should they contact their doctor? Yes. So with the, uh, let's, let's take it by class, with the beta blocker class, if there are going to be side effects, they tend to occur right away. So low heart rate, uh, difficulty breathing, low blood pressure. Um, for those who need to take the beta blocker class, uh, there are a couple of things that can be done. Uh, for example, you can perform what's called digital punctal occlusion, which is essentially pressing one's fingers or a balled up tissue uh, in the corner of the eye near the nose, because that's where the drainage system is. So when you put any kind of drop on the surface of the eye, there tends to be more volume in that drop than is going to remain on the surface. So some of it drains into the nose. Well, the nose, the sinuses are very vascular. So anything that goes into the nasal sinus tissue is going to be absorbed into the bloodstream. So that's one way to do it. Another way, I mentioned that the drops tend to be too big. Another way is to use a drop applicator, such as uh, the Simply Touch. Uh, it's a silicone applicator that's available online. Amazon.com has it for about $15. Um, that allows you to actually place the drop on the surface of this, this tiny little silicone spoon and then place the spoon up against the eye. And by doing so, less drop gets into the eye, so then there's less of an issue with it getting into the sinuses and absorbing into the bloodstream. Uh, there's also the, the option to switch to uh, eye drops that may have less systemic side effects. So I mentioned the Taxol earlier. The Taxol it tends not to give people problems with uh, low blood pressure, low heart rate, things like that but it stings. So there, there's always some kind of uh, uh, payment one way or the other. Uh, now, in terms of the darkening of the eyelid scan, same kind of issue. If you're, if you're dropping one or two drops uh, on the surface of the eye and not blotting it off, uh, if a prostaglandin analog gets onto the skin, it will worsen the darkening of the skin. Um, so, using as little as you possibly can, making sure that uh, you're getting the tissue to remove it, that can, that can help with that. The, um, you know, many of the other side effects are unfortunately just related to the local interaction of that medication with the surface of the eye or the eyelid. And so it's not always possible to eliminate the side effects, uh, but there are some things, as I said, to, uh, to reduce some of them. I guess if a patient has a concern, it really is important to uh, discuss that with your doctor. And, and I guess potentially you could, there might be changes to medication that could minimize. Is that a fair statement? Or? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Any, any types of uh, difficulty that you're having with the medication should be mentioned to your <laughs> physician. And then together, you can work on either alleviating those issues, uh, switching to something else, or finding other ways to deal with them. Uh, there, you know, there will be certain things that uh, uh, you know, are serious enough that, that you will need to move on to another medication. Then again, sometimes we get into a situation where uh, the glaucoma is so severe, the pressure is so high that the only option to eye drops is, is really to consider surgery, uh, which has risks associated with it. Well, and we will talk more about uh, 
surgical options uh, in our in our next webinar. Uh, but we do have some more questions here, and and one of them uh, is an interesting one about um, ophthalmologists maybe being reluctant to uh, prescribe generics. Are there reasons for uh, for that, uh, from your Im impressions uh, of wanting to stick with the brand names, and even though there may be a, a less expensive generic? There are. Uh, what we need to understand with generics is that the only thing that needs to be equivalent in a generic is the active ingredient, right? Um, that may not be as much of an issue when you're taking something by mouth. Right? It's uh, generally absorbed, and you know, if you've got so many milligrams of an active ingredient in a generic versus a brand, once it's absorbed, it should be the same amount that gets into the body. The problem with, with eye drops is that there's the active ingredient, and then there and then there's what we call the vehicle. So it turns out that many of the ingredients in eye drops, the absorption rate will change according to the vehicle. The vehicle can also impact the surface of the eye. Uh, so some vehicles with a different pH may be far more irritating than the brand name. And so we know as physicians that if we prescribe something that's really irritating, it's less likely that our patients are going to take it. Mm -hmm. um, and we've also had experiences with some brands that just don't seem to work as well. So I mentioned earlier the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. Uh, I tend to avoid generic dorzolamide because I've found that depending on the generic brand that my patients are using, their pressure will end up being higher or lower. The problem is, is that pharmacies can substitute a generic. So you can have one brand of generic and then one day the pharmacy just substitutes it for a different brand of generic uh, without necessarily telling the patient or the doctor. And so, you know, then that makes it difficult to figure out, well, is it the, is it the medication that's a problem? Is it an issue with compliance? Is the glaucoma just getting worse? So, I'm not, and many ophthalmologists are not a big fan of certain generics. That being said, there are some generics that seem to work just as well as the brands and are much uh, less expensive. So the beta blocker, uh, Timolol, for example, I've, I've never seen much of a difference between brand and generic. The difference in price is significant. So almost all of my patients on Timolol are on generic Timolol. Um, there are some advantages to a couple of the branded uh, Timolols, and so I will uh, customize that treatment to the needs of my individual patients. And then the prostaglandin analogs. It turns out that latanoprost is just as effective or just about as effective within a millimeter of mercury or so as almost all of the brands. And so I'm very comfortable, as are most ophthalmologists, with prescribing branded or generic prostaglandin analogs. Um, but uh, as I said, the carbonic and hydrase inhibitors, not so much. And then we spoke, I spoke briefly about the uh, alpha agonist class, so bromonidine. The issue there is that the, <clears throat> the generic 0.2% is far less expensive than the brand, but has a higher likelihood of developing an allergy and also tends to cause more irritation and redness than the branded, which also has purite. So branded alpha gan P 0.1% uses purite, which is the disappearing preservative versus the generic, which tends to have back in it. So those are, those are the reasons why we in general will as ophthalmologists prefer a brand over generic. So that uh, raises the interesting question uh, with this new um, uh, long-term uh, injected uh, treatment, the Darista that you spoke about uh, at the end of your presentation. And um, so a question is, does that have any preservative? And um, are, there, are there any benefits for patients maybe that have, say, a lot of reaction uh, or discomfort from the eye drops with something like a uh, an injected uh, treatment. Absolutely, and again, this is I have I have turned 180 degrees in my opinion of the value of Darista. Uh, like I said three years ago, I just thought this is this is ridiculous. Um, you know, who's going to be 
pain, what I'm sure is going to be hundreds, if not uh, over a thousand dollars per treatment for this, um, whether it's patients or insurance for a class of medications that overall is pretty well tolerated. But that being said, uh, the ability to put something in the eye, which again, there's no preservative in it. It's just a, it's a, it's an implant that dissolves over time, which has a high concentration of uh, prostaglandin analog. And, you know, in theory, once it's in the eye, there should be no uh, side effects other than there will be still the iris color change, but there should not be any of the other issues uh, that are associated with the prostaglandin analogs, such as the prostaglandin associated periorbitopathy, which, uh, which for those who are not familiar with it, that is a, uh, a, a um, loss of connective tissue around the eye, which at first can be cosmetically quite nice because it's like having a kind of a, a laser resurfacing, right? Um, but the problem is, is that if it continues, it can actually uh, make people look quite gaunt. Um, and uh, you, know, you can start to see the bony structure around your eyes. And from a clinical perspective, not just a cosmetic perspective, if the tissue shrinks so much that it actually applies some pressure of the eyelids on the eye, it can be difficult to get an accurate pressure measurement in the office on someone with prostaglandin-associated periorbitopathy. So for those reasons, Durista becomes very interesting. But again, the, the, the surprise in all of this uh, and what uh, convinced me that this is something that I will be offering my patients once it's available uh, assuming that, that it is affordable, is that this could potentially be something that does not require every four-month implantation, but, but rather uh, implantation for uh, a number of times and then just monitoring. Uh, so, it, you know, if you can get two years of pressure lowering off of three implantations, uh, then this really starts to be something that, that could make patients' lives much, uh, much easier, decrease the stress associated with, oh, no, did I you know, forget to take my drop last night, um, and, and completely eliminate the issue of, of adherence to a regular schedule. I would still like to see one of the other classes of medications developed as an implant. So, for example, if we could get the... Um, the alpha agonist class, which is a three time a day uh, dosing, if we could get that in an implant, that would be truly wonderful. Um, but uh, I think that this is just the beginning of what we're going to see over the next decade or so. I think we're going to see a number of different types of medicated implants coming out. Now, what about scarring uh, when you make the injection? I, I know the need is a very fine needle, I believe, uh, but are there, is that a problem when you're making these injections? And uh, through, they're through the cornea, I assume. Exactly. So this goes through the cornea, the clear part of the eye, and it would be a very, very small incision. And because it's such a small incision, as long as it's done under uh, sterile conditions, uh, using some uh, faded iron on the surface of the eye, whether it's in the office or the, or the minor procedure room or the OR, uh, you know, the risk of scarring from such a small incision or the risk of infection is, is really quite small. Um, but, you know, there are some risks associated with putting something in the eye. So inflammation is a risk, infection is, is a risk, cataract formation is a risk. Uh, so these aren't necessarily things I'm going to be recommending for my, say, younger patients who are still what we call phatic, so have a natural lens. But for somebody who's already had cataract surgery, um, this would be, I think, a, a very good option. So another question, uh, shifting gears a little bit here, um, uh, and a practical question with um, uh, the COVID-19, a lot of uh, patients have sort of stocked up on their medications, which was a it is a wise thing to do. Um, and the question is really about storage and temperature and uh, the importance of, uh, of keeping the bottles um, at a particular temperature. Is, is, how critical is this for uh, glaucoma medications? 
The answer is it depends. And so I, I like to, um, to use the, the analogy that the glaucoma medications are a bit like you know, buying foods at the grocery store. I mean, you can have certain foods, uh, let's say pasta, for example. There's certain pastas that you can stick in the shelf for years and years and years at room temperature and they'll be just fine. There are other pastas that are fresh that need to be refrigerated. And if you if you stuck them in the, in the cupboard, uh, they'd be ruined in a, in a week or so. The same thing is true with glaucoma medications. You really need to look, and I know those inserts in those bottles, in the, in the boxes, the package inserts are something that both patients and doctors hate. They have incredibly small print, uh, difficult to read, but there is one thing on the insert that I find actually useful, and that is the part where it tells you what the recommended temperature for storage is. And it is different for different classes of medications and even different medications within the same class. Uh, so, for example, the prostate gland analogs, some of them need to be refrigerated until you open them, and others, not so much. Um, in general, you don't want to freeze your drops, and you don't want to leave them in uh, the car on a hot summer day. So extremes are bad for all drops, but in terms of what the ideal temperature is, the next time you get your, uh, your eye drops delivered to you by the pharmacy, pull out the... Uh, uh, the insert and take a look at, at what the recommended storage temperature is. And what about uh, oral medications? A uh, question on methyl methasolamide. Yes. So I, I did not discuss the oral medications. There's essentially only one class of oral medications, which is the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor class. And the interesting thing is, is that as an eye drop, it's the least effective class of medications. As a pill, it can be the most effective. So, for example, the branded name Diamox, which is acetazolamide, is the most effective IOP, so intraocular pressure lowering medication that we have. The problem with acetazolamide is that in the 250 milligram dose, it has to be taken four times a day. Uh, there is an extended release version, which can be taken twice a day at 500 milligrams, but it's more expensive. And Diamox has a number of potential, uh, potentially life-threatening side effects associated with it. Uh, so, you know, an annoying side effect is it's a diuretic. And so you, you have to drink more fluid. So that's just annoying, not life-threatening. Um, but it's also associated with the development of kidney stones, the development of um, uh, reduced potassium, so that needs to be followed because if your potassium is too low, that can affect your, your, your cardiac status, right? Um, it's also associated with a rare but life-threatening condition, aplastic anemia, where the blood count basically drops. So, you know, it's, it's not a medication to be taken lightly, but we do tend to use the oral Dimox or IV around the time of surgery if we're worried about uh, the pressure being too high for a period of time. But we tend not to leave people on it chronically, although I do have a handful of patients who we don't have any other option because for whatever reason, surgery is not an option and they're tolerating it. So it can be done, but you just need to be extra careful. With regard to methazolamide, uh, the brand name Neptazine, um, it's got fewer side effects, but it also just doesn't work as well as acetazolamide. So I have no one currently on that, but I will on a rare day, maybe twice a decade, <laughs> prescribe methazolamide. So anyway. But what about... Um missing drops, you know, maybe for just a few hours or maybe a, uh, forgetting a day? What, what, what do you recommend uh, that patients do? So it really, it depends on the class, right? So uh, the prostaglandin analog class is very forgiving. Uh, many times you can skip a dose and the pressure is still under good control even the next morning through the next day. I have a number of patients who uh, are able to check their pressures at home. Either they have a, a Rikert uh, Aura or a 7CR unit uh, or the eye care home. Uh, I also provide for my patients uh, the option of we, we have eye care homes in the office uh, that patients can take home and for a week check their pressure if they want. Um, 
you know, so I do have patients who have monitored their pressure and under these controlled conditions, I will allow them to use prostaglandin analogs every other night instead of every night. Let's say if they're having a lot of these side effects we talked about with prostaglandin analogs, but I limit that for those patients who have the ability to confirm that they're not spiking. Um, I also allow all of my patients to come into the office at any time and just get their pressure checked. They don't need an appointment with me. And I wish that this was more common because what I don't like about glaucoma is the fact that we're making these decisions on pressure measurements that are done once every three or four months. Now, I would like to have pressure measurements every day, and I'm hoping we can get to the point where monitoring glaucoma is more like monitoring diabetes with patients, you know, as they can check their blood sugar at home. Uh, they should be checking their eye pressure as well. Um, so with the, with the case through prostaglandin analogs, not so much of an issue. On the other hand, with the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, Azopt and uh, Trusopt, or the alpha agonist class, uh, alpha gan P, uh, it's, it's very critical that a minimum twice a day dosing be used on those, right? I mean, really they should be used three times a day. It's just so incredibly difficult to get consistently that middle of the day dosing. Um, but if, if someone is taking, um, an alpha agonist or a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor in the morning and forgetting the nighttime dose, then they've lost the effect. It will not last more than eight hours. And really, it only lasts about six. Um, on the other hand, Timolol, a beta blocker. Uh, I have most of my patients now on Timolol just, uh, just once a day in the morning. Uh, if they do take it twice a day, I recommend that they take the, the second dose in the early afternoon because the beta blocker class does not work uh, in the evening. So there's no effect in the evening, but there can be an effect on the blood pressure. And so, uh, so timing is important. And there are many nuances that uh, you know, don't get discussed in a typical short visit in the office. Uh, so I, you know, I'm, I'm glad yeah, that we're doing a, this. <laughs> a good transition uh, comment, uh, David. And Unfortunately, we don't really have time for more questions right now. But uh, to your point, uh, when sometimes when there are more questions or when patients uh, think of a question after they've left the office, uh, we really encourage them to visit our website, glaucoma.org, for more answers and for the latest information about new treatments and also to learn about our research and uh, the things happening at Glaucoma Research Foundation. Also, we're now on Instagram. And again, uh, there are videos and articles and updates there. And so I encourage you to follow us. Uh, Glaucoma Research Foundation also just completely updated our booklet, Understanding and Living with Glaucoma. And the new one is now in print. Uh, you can order a print copy on our website, or you can download it free from our website. And again, uh, you'll find lots of information about medications, about side effects, and just about glaucoma, uh, as well as um, how to live with glaucoma in our new booklet. We uh, also want to, again, thank David for making time with us today and for his dedication to helping with glaucoma. At Glaucoma Research Foundation, we are as committed as ever, especially in this uncertain time, to our mission to cure glaucoma and restore vision and provide important information for patients and caregivers. And I uh, want to encourage you to take your vision seriously and work with your doctors to help maintain your vision. We want to thank Airy Pharmaceutical for their support of the meeting and thank you all for joining us today. And again, thank you, Dr. Richardson. Thank you.